It was a whole new era in a way they never really could have understood. When our troops returned home from World War II, that they were coming back to the lives they left behind, or so they thought, but there were so many changes that were coming down the pike for our country, the things they never could have foreseen. That the U.S. would become the global superpower that it is, that globalism would take place, so you didn't need colonies all over the place to get your raw materials, but you had a open sea lanes patrolled by American Navy to make sure that free trade could happen. Everything that happened with the Cold War, there were just so many things that were on the horizon that there's no way the average guy ever could have seen coming. Whether they knew it or not, they were stepping into a whole new era. You see, as we enter the second half of the book of John, we're going to have an opportunity in this Bible study to look at John 13 to 17, to have an opportunity to sit behind closed doors and to listen to Jesus' final conversation with his disciples. And as he talked to them, they didn't know it yet, but they were on the verge of a whole new era. The time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. And in this conversation, he prepares them for that time. And he prepares you. Because you and I live in the midst of that era. We live as people who look back at the first time Jesus came and look forward to the second time he comes. And Jesus sets the tone for this whole new era by summarizing the Christian life for us in our section, John chapter 13, beginning at verse 34. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. I don't know if you know it or not, but we get the term Maundy from Maundy Thursday from this new command. It's an anglicized version of the Latin word for command. And what makes it new isn't necessarily that God had never come up with this before. Love was always the thing that lay at the heart of God's eternal will. It's always been that way. It's just that up until Jesus came and fulfilled the law, you saw all these rules and regulations that pointed ahead to Christ. Paul calls them a shadow of things to come. But now Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's about to die and rise again. And when he does that, all those rules and regulations, they fade to the background, and it's a cross that stands front and center. It was a whole new era, a time where we see most clearly God's love for us on the cross and also what it means then for us to show that love to others. And it's exactly that point that Jesus makes at the beginning of John chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. We read, It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. Do you see how Jesus sets the stage here? He says he, he is over all things, and his time in this world is just about done. And so now it's time for him to show. And how does he show it? By taking the lowest job in the house, by washing the disciples' feet. Notice the difference between Jesus' status and his role. He's Lord of all creation. And yet he sinks as low in service as you can sink. See how Jesus applies this to the Christian life. We continue. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not understand now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. Well, can't you just imagine the whole room going quiet? As Jesus takes on the lowliest job in the house, and one by one he begins to wash the disciples' feet, and they're wondering what in the world is happening, why Jesus, Lord of all, is sinking to such a low point of service. 
And Peter, he just says what everyone's thinking. He points out the obvious difference between Jesus' status and his role, at least is how he sees it. And he asks Jesus about it. And Peter, it seems as if what he says comes from a place of respect and love for Jesus, and it does. But it also betrays a misunderstanding. You see, oftentimes in this world, we view the fact that if you have status, if you have high standing, then that means that you don't sink low in service to others, but they serve you. But Jesus says exactly the opposite for us. In fact, he says this is the only way it can work. You see, the only way you and I can have a relationship with God is if you and I are recipients of his grace. And grace, by definition, is something he gives for free. You see, if you and I are going to have a place in God's family, he must serve us by sinking as low as you can sink, by dying on the cross for your sin and mine, so you and I can be clean. You see, Peter needed to realize that this is the Christian life. Jesus died for us, and we serve each other in the same way. Look how Jesus continues. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. You see, Jesus pointed out that he is Lord of all things, and yet he sinks as low as you can sink in service to us, dying in your place and mine. And that is the only way it can work. That's what grace is. So often people come to Jesus with a list of things they think they can do for him. But at the end of the day, if you and I are going to be people of God, it's because God serves us, because he dies for us, because he forgives us, because he saves us. In the same way, when you and I live our lives as Christians, we serve others. We sink as low as we can sink when it comes to our role as fathers and mothers, as husbands and wives, as members of society, as as employers or employees, as a neighbor, as a member of a church, whatever the hat it is you wear in life. The Christian life is to sink as low as we can sink in service to others. And be just like Jesus, who sank all the way to death on the cross for you and for me. You see, love had always been at the center of what it meant to be a follower of God. But now when Jesus came and died on the cross, all those rules and regulations would fade away, and the cross is what stands there crystallized as what the Christian life looks like and where salvation is found. We continue then, reading in John 13, as Jesus talks now about the reality of love. He says, I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I've chosen, but this is to fulfill the passage of Scripture. He who shares his bread has turned against me. I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. You see, love, it it doesn't give up that easy. Jesus loved the people in that room. He loved those disciples. He loved Judas. And yet he knew Judas was about to take that love and throw it back in his face. And Jesus could have been angry about it. He could have taken him by the scruff of the neck and thrown him out that night. But instead, if you keep reading this section, what you'll see is Jesus reaching out to him. No one else in the room really understood who Jesus was talking about, but Judas did. And when Jesus tells Judas to go out and do what he was about to do, he first hands him a piece of bread, an expression of hospitality. You see, Jesus gives Judas every chance. The fact that Jesus knew from the beginning what would happen, the fact that God knows what what, what we would say or do, doesn't mean that he causes it. There's a difference between foreknowledge and culpability. You see, Judas takes God's love and he throws it back in Jesus' face. But love doesn't walk away that easily. You see, it's a sad story as you read the story of Judas, how he disappears into the night. And yet, we see Jesus go to the cross nonetheless to pay for Judas' sin as much as you and I. As we continue now, Jesus is going to talk about how it's this love that lay at the center of his glory. 
We'll jump ahead to John 13, verse 31. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I'll be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. You see, Jesus says now is a time for him to show his glory. How to, to, what makes God great? And boy, if you were to think of it, if you were to show what makes God great, what would you pick? Would you pick his power, his unlimited knowledge, his eternity, his transcendence? No, but his glory, what he's talking about is the cross. He's talking about taking on the sin of the human race and being crushed for it in your place and mine. It seems like the, the lowliest time in Jesus' life. It seems like the opposite of glory, but it is his greatest glory because he did it for you. It really gives you a, a window into the heart of God, doesn't it? That if God were to rank all of his characteristics, if he were to tell you what it is that, that makes him a great God, it's that he loves us to the point of suffering and dying for us on the cross. That love, it lay at the center of God's glory. It's who he is. It's what makes him exactly the God that we need. And it's with that background then that Jesus says a passage you looked at at the beginning. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You see, this is the era in which we live. The era between Jesus' first and second coming. Love was always a part of the equation. It was always what summarized the Old Testament law. Remember when Jesus speaks to a, to an, a teacher of the law, he says that ultimately the law is summarized by saying, love God and love your neighbor. But all those rules and regulations, they had a way of pointing ahead to Christ. But when Jesus came, it's as if Jesus comes to the foreground and all those rules and regulations, they sink to the background and disappear. And all you see is love. In your small group Bible study, you're going to have an opportunity to talk about what it means to serve each other as Jesus served us, what it means to wash one another's feet, and what it means to see that the command God has given us is to love others as he has loved us. It really sums up the era in which we live. God's blessings on your study.